Hello and welcome to Liberty Law Talk. I'm your host, Richard Reinch. Liberty Law Talk is featured at the online journal Law and Liberty, which is available at lawliberty.org. Welcome to Liberty Law Talk. I'm Richard Reinch. Today we're talking with Stephen Smith about his new book, Reclaiming Patriotism in an Age of Extremes. Stephen Smith is the Alfred Cowles Professor of Political Science at Yale University. He's the author of uh, numerous books on Leo Strauss, Spinoza, Hegel, and he previously appeared on Liberty Law Talk a few years ago to discuss his book, Modernity and Its Discontents, which has been released in paperback. So, Stephen Smith, it's great to have you on again. Thank you, Richard. It's a pleasure to be back. Stephen, thinking about the book, Reclaiming patriotism in an age of extremes. Why do we need patriotism? Well, that's a good question to start with. Why do we need patriotism? Because obviously not everybody thinks we do. And the book began or grew out of an attempt to distinguish patriotism from people or to reclaim patriotism, I should say, as the title is, to reclaim it from people who don't like it and therefore who think we don't need it at all, and from people who, what to say, like it too much. And patriotism, I want to argue, is a disposition which I think is inseparable from politics, so long as we are what Aristotle called political animals, so long as we live in polities and political and states, we need patriotism. It's inseparable from a sense of loyalty and identity to the place where we belong. But patriotism, we can go into this, is an easily misunderstood virtue. It is, as I suggested a second ago, it is from one side, it is identified often with all that's wrong or even what's as responsible for all that's wrong in our politics today. And from the other side, it seems to express everything, and it's only what's good in our life, in our, in our political life. So it's a difficult virtue. It is a difficult virtue, and it's a, it's a contested virtue. And we can talk about that yeah. if you like. Well, thinking about the title of your book, An Age of Extremes, so let, let's just bracket for a minute. I think you and I both agree a patriotism is a good thing. It's a needed thing. It's, I think, a consolation in a difficult life in a difficult world. But what are the extremes right now that are that are currently operating that are leading us astray from properly understanding it? Patriotism, I start, has always been contested. Go back to the ancient world. One example I use in my book is Sophocles' Antigone, which puts forward a conflict between loyalty to the family and loyalty to country. Patriotism has always been contested by other loyalties we have, and that will never go away. I mean, we are beings with conflicting loyalties, and so long as we remain beings with conflicting loyalties, patriotism will be challenged by other loyalties we have. The two dominant challenges to patriotism today come from, I've already suggested the left and right, and they pretty much map onto that distinction. I'll start with the left, what we might call the cosmopolitan left, the kind of view that you find particularly in educated circles and among business elites, among educated people, among a range of people who believe that we have become or are becoming citizens of the world. We owe our allegiances are to a kind of global humanity, and we all know particular allegiance to the individual states of which we are members. You see that in uh, the enthusiasm, particularly among young people, and it's, it's admirable in many ways. I'm not, I'm not just discounting it, but there are admirable goals to work for international NGO, to become part of Doctors Without Borders, to think of global concerns like, you know, the environment and other things. Again, absolutely real. But the tendency is to downplay or to minimize the role of their identity as citizens, as citizens of a country rather than global citizens, citizens of the world. The other extreme that is nationalism. And that, of course, has in the last five or six years or more, even so maybe more, 
become a very potent force throughout the world, not only in, in the, and in the U.S. too, including the U.S. We've seen nationalisms arising in China, in Turkey, in Russia, certainly in places like Hungary, Brazil, many other places. Nationalism is a very potent force of political identity. But different from patriotism, I want to argue. They are often linked, but one of the things I try to do in my book is to decouple them. They grow out of a common root. Uh, nationalism and patriotism are not opposite, as it's sometimes said. They are not opposite. They grow out of a common root. And that root is to have your way of life and your culture and so on to be strong and respected, natural and within limits, understandable and admirable quality. But patriotism and nationalism, while growing out of a common group, move in different directions. The nationalist sees the country as the only source of their identity. And then this is very easy for it to become coupled with feelings of anger, resentment, and most dangerously, the attempt to identify enemies, beginning often with foreign enemies, but then always becoming domestic enemies, domestic others who are seen to present some kind of existential challenge to the national identity. And it is this kind of friend-enemy logic that I think is invariably grows out of the nationalist mindset, the nationalist imagination, that is quite different from the patriotic disposition that I try to defend in my book. But those are the two, I think, challenges that uh, kind of frame the debate as I see it. Do you see, I mean, as I read your book, it, it seems to me also nationalism arising from you know, perceived excesses of, of, let's say, humanitarianism or sort of downplaying what I think would be legitimate interest of the nation or what I think about Brexit I see, mm-hmm. uh, I, I mean, and as I, you know, when the Brexit campaign was happening, I saw good arguments on either side for that position. Right. And I, and I ultimately thought, well, if the people come out and vote at like 70% and it's, you know, they vote 52%, then I would respect that vote. But I, I also saw that to be, you know, this belief that the European Union was just ever increasing and was actively, yeah. I mean, some of their statesmen actively downplay. I think what I would call legitimate interest of the nation. And so you get, Mm -hmm. you get nationalism arising from that, but that in turn feeds its opposite. And I think, you know, as, as I read your book, what makes patriotism a virtue as you say? Well, let me say I discuss, I'm I'm certainly not an expert on the EU, but it comes out for some discussion in my book. And I do think the debate about Brexit and, I listened to it and followed it, and there were powerful arguments on both sides. But I do think one of the the EU is seen what is or or was. I mean, the EU is now becoming terribly fractured, but it was seen by many sort of in the heyday of its ascendancy as sort of a model of this kind of notion of transnational or transpolitical citizenship or sovereignty or something, a seamless world of of open borders, of common currency, of free trade. I mean, it had many dimensions, many of them quite valuable and and useful, but it created aspirations and dreams and ideals that could not be satisfied. And this movement was always combined as you pointed out, with a heavy-handed bureaucratic apparatus that really ended up, in many ways, overriding people's national institutions, their loyalties. They were told to be their um, members of Europe. What is that? And so there was always this tension between, in many ways, the aspiration and the, again, the, the bureaucratic apparatus in which those aspirations were unfolded. So... The EU is one example of how exactly this kind of tendency towards cosmopolitanism and to believe that we are are now outgrowing the nation state as the basis of our political identity and show how this can go wrong. But let me just say, before I 
sounds like I'm simply in the camp of the EU skeptics or, or the anti-EU. EU. I'm not. And why do I say that? Because the EU, for everything that is questionable about it, has done one very important thing that I don't think we can entirely forget. And that is it has managed and will manage to maintain the peace in a continent that was the most violent continent of the last century, certainly the last century, and perhaps perhaps even the most violent continent in, in, in all of the recorded history. The world wars, the Holocaust, the ethnic cleansings that European states imposed on one another were just terrible blemishes on, on, the, on, the, you know, on, mm-hmm. on humanity. And the EU has rose to respond to that and to some degree has very admirably pacified many of these aggressive European tendencies. So I don't, that is nothing to see that. And so I just want to mention that it's something that I think deserves to be said about, about the EU, whatever it's, it's other failings. Yeah, that's well said. Although it does seem to me now uh, in the history of, I mean, you recounted it well and all of its horrors, it does seem to me, I mean, I guess what comes to mind when I think about Europe in many ways is sort of a lethargic continent now. I, I was reading recently by 2007, the economy of the European Union was largely on par with America's. Uh, but what's happened in the last 14 years is it's barely grown and the American economy has grown and, and we've sort of moved beyond them in a lot of ways. And a lot of people thought the EU economy would overtake us. And then of course, now our big concern is China and what it's doing. And I could produce a lot of examples, demographics, where Europe just seems, although it, it was this tremendous dynamo, to me, it just seems sort of like a, a large vacation park at this point. But I wonder if this reluctance to understand these sorts of virtues of home that are at least, I think, a part of patriotism. I agree. I think I don't want to sit here and opine about the future of Europe. I no, I, I, I don't know. Uh, but you know, two devastating world wars within a fifty-year span can do a lot to take the life out of a people. And yes, that's true. I don't know. I I hear what you're saying, and what you say is probably right in, in some respects. You have a an interesting epigraph here. And I thought it might be a way to get into a question that I've got for you, which is you said patriotism is a virtue. And I think that's at the center of the controversy. You have the epigraph. I am an American Chicago born uh, from Saul Bellows, the adventures of Augie March. Can you elaborate more on that for us? Yeah, that's great. Thank you for, for mentioning that. I'm glad you, you caught that because that epigraph means a lot to me. Why? First, I've been a more or less lifelong admirer, lover of Saul Bellow's literature. That famous opening sentence, I'm an American Chicago born, first sentence, opening sentence of his adventures of Augie March, captured something to me, not just of the spirit of that novel, but of me. Uh, I also am an American Chicago born, and I lived away from Chicago for many, many years. More than half my life has been spent in, in New Haven, where I, I, I live now. But this identification with a place, I think, is very important. It shaped me to, to a considerable, for, for good and for bad. I don't necessarily simply have a kind of rosy, nostalgic image of the place where I grew up. Uh, I don't uh, at all, really. But you know, we are shaped by our mm-hmm. by our past, by our histories, uh, our family histories, our national histories. And I thought that statement, uh, that sentence, uh, captured uh, something very important about that. Did to me at least. You know, I thought it was. It reminded me of the opening of Ulysses Grant's memoirs. He says, "My people are American." That's always resonated with me. When I read that sentence, I always thought that's something new. I would think in an American life at that time that you, you think of this as an American civilization and your people being shaped by it. Yes. I mean, in Augie Mark is a very American story. Of course, the difference between that and Grant is Grant traces his ancestors back to the Puritans, back to the, the real founders. Bellows, Augie Mark, is like Bellows himself, is the uh, is child of immigrants. I am the uh, grandchild of immigrants. So it, it 
there's a kind of vibrancy about this too, and a kind of yeah. the title of the book, The Adventures, that shows that this is a this is kind of a picaresque novel. It's an adventure. It's an adventure story in some way, and I think that's very much the American story that I hope I tried to capture in my understanding of patriotism. That it's an adventure. Yeah. Uh, it has an aspirational. It has an aspirational quality to it. And that, to me, is, is very much one of the things that distinguishes patriotism from nationalism also, is this sense of aspiration and adventure. It's not just a land and soil ideology. It's not just America first. It's not simply, you know, my country right or wrong. There is an ideal and an adventure and a creed to it that makes, I think, American patriotism unique. Let's talk more about that. In your book, you talk about the elements of American patriotism. Talk about that, because you know, as, as we think about patriotism, you said it's a disposition, a virtue. So there has to be a common thread there. It, it can just be purely an adventure. Sure. No, no, I, absolutely. There is a core, uh, I mean, a core, broad, broadly defined core that for generations was called very loosely the American Creed. What is the American creed? It was not anything formulated necessarily in a, in a document or a legal text of, of any kind, but it was a set of beliefs and ideas growing out of our founding documents that shaped what it is to be an American. For example, let me just mention three. Our commitment to equality, going back most famously to the Equality Clause in the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. We are all endowed with a certain basic dignity that is worthy of respect. And that egalitarian impulse is a very important aspect of American patriotism. What does equality mean? In part, it means there are no more aristocrats, no more monarchs and aristocrats. Uh, it is an open field. It's an, it's an open field for all of us to rise or fall. It's a field of rights, that we have liberties and, and rights that are central to that. And once again, that these are aspirational, that we, as Lincoln points out, most, probably most famously in his speech on the Dred Scott case, that our aspirations to equality and dignity have not been fully uh, achieved. They are constantly... Uh, as you put, being labored for, being uh, worked upon, and being a sense of a work in progress. Okay. But it is this idea that we are a creedal nation, a creedal people, has been the core of the idea of some of our best students of American politics. Let me just mention three of those students, Samuel Huntington, Seymour Martin Lipset, and Martin Diamond. All of them saw this sense of creedal peoplehood as essential to America, and that's in part what my book is an attempt to re reestablish. Yeah, and as I read that, you think about what country has something like the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, the, there's there's a creedal idea of America that could also be used in various ways. Thinking about that creedal concept, is that enough? I guess was my question for you. And I guess I say, is that enough? Because as I think about the human person, I think about our relationships with others, our communities, communities of moral worth and meaning that we find. I think, I mean, it's a long conversation, but I think that's a huge problem now in America is I think a lot of people look around them and don't see communities they want to join or they feel abandoned in, in various ways. And so I, and then what about memories and battles, ways in which people attach themselves to the country? How does the creedal concept incorporate those things? A great point, Richard. And it's one that I work on in the book. Uh, I've, been, I've been emphasizing, and we've been emphasizing together, this aspirational or creedal dimension of American patriotism. But in many ways, that's only one side of the coin. And I argue in different ways in the book that patriotism is like all virtues in many ways, patriotism is a matter of both the head and the heart. It is both an intellectual virtue based upon understanding of our founding documents and the, and the principles for which we stand, but it's also a matter of the heart. 
and it's also connected to loyalty. Uh, I spend a lot of time in the book talking about what is loyalty and how is loyalty a virtue, associating it with these, as you were pointing out, this, these ideas of membership and being a part of something. Patriotism isn't just or can't be exhausted by our aspirations, although it's that, but it's also an appreciation. Uh, it's very much rooted in ideas of appreciation, of gratitude is a term that I, I use a few times throughout the book. It's a sense of gratitude. Being a patriot is in many ways, I say, like being a member of a family. And yeah. here I think that, that helps us also distinguish patriotism from nationalism. We have been shaped by our families. For better or worse, we've been shaped by our families. But we love our families. I mean, we usually do. I mean, unless, you know, under some extraordinary... <laughs> but, you know, we, love, we usually love our families. It would be absurd to say, my family better than your family. You know, my family first. No. In many ways, we love our families because of their imperfections. That's what makes our families, you know, in, in, in some ways. But they have shaped us. And I think patriotism is a virtue, is a loyalty virtue, like family membership that is rooted in loyalty and gratitude for shaping who we are. So that, that is the other side of, uh, you know, I call it the head and the heart. Uh, I, in, I use two fancy Greek terms in the book. I, I speak of logos and ethos. Mm -hmm. uh, reason, logos, and ethos is, is character. And I do speak of patriotism as a character-shaping virtue. It is a virtue of character. It, it shapes who, who we are. I cite uh, a famous Greek philosopher, Heraclitus, who says, our ethos, our character is our destiny. Uh, that may be a bit too strong, but I do think he captures that, that, that quality of what I call ethos patriotism, which I think is the way I sort of interpret what you were uh, trying to bring out. I, I think is a very strong component in what I think of as the patriotic disposition. Let me ask you, you, you said loyalty, and I agree with you, there does, and we struggle with that, contemporaries. We struggle with that idea of, of being loyal to something. And you discuss in the book, I'll say two of our leading cosmopolitans, Martha Nussbaum and George Kitab, who both in various ways, and you could talk about it more, seem to suggest or seem to argue patriotism is an affront to enlightenment principles of liberty. Why? Well, it's because of this loyalty thing. It's because of this dispositional thing. I don't get to choose. I don't get to be a willing agent of my self-development. I'm sort of with everyone else by virtue of where I've been born and all of that history and what all those people think, and I don't get to be me. And what's really me is to be transactional with a lot of other people across borders, around the world, around civilizations, and to have sort of this menu of things I can choose from. That's very attractive. And from what I'm reading, it's very attractive to people in their 20s and 30s. They want to live their lives like this. But, you know, and, and as, of course, you know, Roger Scruton always would, would talk about this, uh, and this this will be strong. You know, the claim would be many are xeno, or patriotism is subject to xenophobia, but there's also an oikophobia <clears throat> here too. I think we could discuss or fear of home, uh, hatred of home. And I thought maybe maybe you might address those concerns. I don't think you're saying ethos and character is destiny. I, I think you're also saying, particularly with regard to American patriotism, it's contested. And we argue about it. And even the elements you list of American patriotism, it's an ongoing argument. We could lose balance. Say egalitarianism runs amok. Uh, you say that's an important American value. I agree. And it starts to win out and we lose a lot of other things. So I just wanted to throw all that in. You probably said it at least as well, better than I would. I'm glad you mentioned the article. I got an email the other night from, from George K. Chubb congratulating me for the book and, he, he, and, and also expressing disappointment that I don't see things his way. <laughs> and I said, you know, yeah, I said, you know, George, what the hell, you know, the argument is better than, than the agreement you yeah. know, anyway. But George is a great man. I unhesitatingly say that I do, even though we passionately disagree on the nature of the subject. And he's right. There is much in the American experience that he draws on going back to Emerson, going back to sort of the American transcendentalism, that was the first movement to really give voice to this kind of free 
uh, wheeling individualism, you know, that we have. I mean, in, in many ways, once again, it's, it's an admirable quality of, of Americans, our, our individualism, our sort of sense that uh, nobody can tell me what to do, or that we want to figure things out for ourselves, that we, I mean, this is, we, we shouldn't be constrained simply to live in the way that our parents lived if we don't want to. I mean, this is, in many ways, a crucial part of America, and one that I think is invaluable. I very much appreciate that claim. Yet, I would say, and I think we were, we were getting at this a little while ago, that is only part of the story. I mean, in many ways, this kind of expressive individualism that Thoreau and others uh, have, is, is a kind of heroic, dis- they, they presented it as a heroic disposition, the ability to break free of custom and tradition, to live as you like. These are cliches today, uh, but there was originally something heroic in the model of how to live in, in, in a certain way. It's not to say that most of us aren't heroes in that way, but it is to say that many of us, in fact, find meaning in the way we've been brought up, in the traditions we've, we've inherited, in the customs and habits that have formed and shaped us. We don't feel we need to. I mean, m- most people don't feel a need to challenge and to resist the forces of history, tradition, and family and custom. So we have to find a way to hold those two together. Mm -hmm. If we want to bring this up to the moment in, in some ways, I think what we're witnessing today in much of our, our culture and politics is the outgrowth of a kind of angry libertarianism that says basically nobody nobody has the right to tell me what to do. That is not a good formula for society. It may work in some occasions and in some contexts for individuals, but as members of a society, it's not a useful, uh, to put it mildly, it's, it's not a useful formula. And I think a lot of that. Uh, I would say, angry libertarianism we see expressed in the response to COVID. It's a, it's a conspiracy. Nobody can tell me what, that I should put on a mask or something. Society, we live in a society, and that requires that we make certain uh, sacrifices. I mean, it seems to be pretty minimal to me, but for many people, it's an affront to their liberty. And I think that's one of the dangerous sides of the kind of what they used to call abstract individualism that uh, uh, is, is very much part of the American character. Thinking here, angry libertarianism, there's also this, this notion, too, of to make patriotism works requires enough of us who disagree with one another to put things like law and the nation and... I'll say, I mean, we say the Constitution or being a constitutional people, that that is above everything else. That's above who's going to win an election because what we know is probably the next election, you know, the other side's going to lose or, or, the, or the following election. And so we're able to live with those results. Uh, we're able to live with, say, some laws being passed that we, that we don't like uh, because we know there's, there's probably going to be a reversal. And that's how I have looked at a lot of things is like, I mean, mm-hmm. I, and this is very, I mean, a very dour look. Even that sort of formal consensus breaks down. And I think that's really at the essence of patriotism or a, I'll say, a humane loyalty to your country that there are things we just don't question. And because we acknowledge that it's so good, it's not that we're ignorant or silly or don't, or not educated. Well, it's, we just know these are good things. And so that must be unquestionable. And that itself is now in dispute. So I, I see a lot of like the COVID stuff happening, like this, this basic distrust. Not that the government at times doesn't earn it, but this is sort of a basic distrust out there you see. And I think that fuels a lot of the stuff. Look, I couldn't agree more with the way you just uh, framed the issue. I think it is a matter of patriotism requires trust. It requires stability. There are a series of kind of qualities that it it embraces. It also requires a sense of our our own fallibility, an awareness that we may be wrong, or at least that what we believe is maybe only partially true. These are qualities that are 
essential to a decent society and have been eroded. Uh, I mean, we could talk about the sources for the erosion of, of social trust and this kind of ethos, as I call it, that has you know, the, the glue in a, in a certain way for what, what binds people together and what makes patriotism possible. And, you know, a lot of sociologists, political scientists have talked about this in kind of more empirical ways in recent years. I think probably most famously, you know, we, we all remember Robert Putnam's book, Bowling Alone, uh, the decline of associations in America kind of resulting in, a, in an atomization uh, that was written back in the 90s, I think, and maybe the early 2000s, where we hadn't really seen the full consequences of the break of, of what happens with that atomization. And I think what happens with it is not just people no longer join with others. It, it leads to a, a breakdown of trust among people, among neighbors, among citizens. And that breakdown of trust leads us to see others as enemies. In some ways, they're not just others to us; they're they're enemies. And uh, mm-hmm. this is more and more. I, I fear the the world we are living in. And the question, the book. Uh, I mean, if I knew how to restore this, I I guess I would win the Nobel Prize or something and something. <laughs> but it is trying to find both institutions, but also not just institutions, habits of hearts and minds that will restore the conditions for a decent patriotism. I agree wholeheartedly there. I I mean, I just think, too, in the past year, I mean, we've had these sorts of jarring experiences, obviously, with COVID being one. And then the way it seems to me our political class, every conflict we get in, they manage to find the most intense way to to come at it. And so things can't be negotiated or, or compromised. And, and that just sort of drives things. So I I look around my neighborhood, which no one has any reason really to be that upset about much. I see neighborhood signs with, uh, I believe in Peter Fauci. I see the signs about, which, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I mean, these are suburbanites in Indianapolis. Why? I mean, are you this plugged into politics? I mean, this just sort of uh, being someone who is interested in politics is most people for most of my life have not really cared and, and think that I'm kind of weird for caring so much. And now this is like up front in everyone's mind, not in a good way. I do think in terms of patriotism, something that every most nations struggle with, uh, particularly in the West, is just the, the harder question of borders mm-hmm. and immigration. And that's obviously very contested and has been for much of American history. How does the American patriot think about immigration? Yeah, that's something I talk about in the book. And like most people, I don't I don't have an answer to that. There's not a simple answer to it. Just state the obvious. We are a nation of immigrants. Not to say the history of immigration has been a happy one. I mean, we have not always welcomed the immigrant. You know, give us your core, your tired, your huddled mass that's yearning to breathe free. This was not always the way immigrants were, were treated, uh, going back to, you know, the er- early part of the republic. But we are a nation of immigrants. And the question is, how does a society like ours both balance diversity, ethnic, racial diversity, immigrants, and new immigrants, new people to the table, with a sense that we are still one people, in a way, you know, e pluribus unum, out of, out of many, one. That balance between the many and, you know, to kind of put it in highfalutin philosopher's terms, you know, how to combine the one and the many, how to do that. If we say our borders are endlessly open, uh, everybody's welcome in all at once, we lose our ethos. We lose any sense of who we are as a people. But if we begin to say we're filled up, you know, no more or very few, then we are in danger of losing our humanity. And I would only say, you know, on this question, there's not an algorithm for determining this. It's just a willingness to people, our leadership class, to compromise on these on these issues. I mean, immigrants can be are a source of new blood and new Yeah. New businesses. New ways. And at the same time we, we live in a world of borders. I mean, I very much believe that. I totally believe in the Treaty of Westphalia solution. You know, we live in a world of states and states are defined by borders and they have the rights to 
determine who's in and who's out. Of course, you can determine that broadly or narrowly, but I very much believe that. That is the basis of our stability. And again, I, I would say, I mean, you ask maybe the hardest question facing American public policy or legislation today on this question of immigration. It's so powerful and so potent on all sides. It requires statesmanship. It requires statecraft, statesmanship, compromise, and a willingness to stop demonizing each other. Yeah. No, I think that's well said. Another hard question, maybe less less controversial. Well, it, it, equally controversial, but not in the public eye as much. And this is something that I think Nussbaum and, and your friend uh, George Kateb would, would point to are conflicts between our loyalties. And how do those get settled? And does patriotism not offer a fulfilling settlement? Speaking of, so our, you know, our country, our family, for many of us, our religious faith— and our conscience, and those do come into conflict. Absolutely. And and so how does the patriot think about these conflicts? Wonderful question. I have a section of the book going back to our earlier theme of our discussion uh, when I talked about conflict of loyalties. When, in fact, patriotism comes in conflict, love of country, with other duties or loyalties that we, that we inhabit. Uh, my favorite example... I used a few, but I'll just mention my favorite, is the one that Lincoln encountered. Uh, Lincoln figures, I should say, for those who haven't read the book, Lincoln figures prominently in it. In the midst of Civil War, Lincoln was visited in the White House by a lady named Mrs. Eliza Gurney, a, a Quaker. She came as the head of kind of a Quaker delegation. And Lincoln apparently very much appreciated the visit not because she was coming to hector him about something, but they wanted to pray with him. And the Quakers were in a difficult dilemma because they were anti-slavery. They favored emancipation and anti-slavery, and yet at the same time, we know they are anti-war. And Lincoln appreciated that dilemma, how if they fall on one side of the, of the equation, they cannot support the war effort. If they fall on the other side of the equation, they seem to be in violation of their religious beliefs. I mean, it's, it's a painful moral conflict. And Lincoln sent her a beautiful letter to the effect stating that dilemma very beautifully and saying something to the effect that I have and will do all I can as commander-in-chief to honor both sides of that. But he admitted, more or less, that even Lincoln couldn't figure out, you know, which of the sides was right and what to do. That, that was going to be left, obviously, to each person, each member of the Quaker faith to have to, have to work out for themselves. So that was a very powerful example, a real-world example of the kind of a very, very serious conflict of duties between patriotism and in this case, religious fidelity. There are others, too. I consider some examples from literature, some from from film. There's a wonderful scene in in The Godfather, one of my favorite films, that that, that, that deals with exactly this question. In that particular instance, it's a conflict between family loyalty and loyalty to country. But these are real, and that's why I say patriotism is a contested virtue. I also deal with questions of patriotism and protest. I mean, there are issues not only when we have a conflict of obligations, as it were, the kind you know I was just talking about, but then, then there's question of, is it ever patriotic to protest? I mean, we hear this is almost as a cliche. Uh, it is a cliche. Protest is patriotic. You know, well, my answer is yes and no. You know, it all like so many things in politics it depends on the context. So I, I try to sort that out, out a little bit as, as well. But my point being in general, patriotism does not automatically just trump every other loyalty and obligation that we have. It, it is, as I said, contested. And it's probably a good thing, too. It remains and always will remain a contested virtue. But at the same time, one we can't do without. Stephen Smith, thank you so much for your time. We've been talking with the author of Reclaiming Patriotism, 
in an age of extremes. This is Richard Reinch. You've been listening to another episode of Liberty Law Talk, available at lawliberty.org.